Andrew, did you want to start us out here? All right. Jennifer Taylor, Jefferson County Citizens for Healthcare Access, is coming forward. I want to tell you 
by Kevin Vanavay was also invited, and I talked to him the other day. He was not able to attend. He and his family are busy with holiday preparations. He did not want me to relay the message that he's sorry that he can't be here, but that today his family was the priority. He said that, uh, he went on to say that healthcare access is a huge priority for him. He said that he and Steve work closely together and he and Steve would discuss the forum uh, when they see each other uh, later on. He asked that we keep in mind that, the, that Steve and his views are very similar. Both are currently on the ha House Health and Wellness Committee for 2013 and are awaiting committee designations for 2000, I'm sorry, I did that wrong, 2015. Um, they're on it now for 2014. He urged me to give you his cell number and because he wants his constituents, constituents to be able to contact him if you want to. So on the back of your agenda is Kevin Vanavay's cell number. All right? So we thank him for that. I want to, I wanna, before we start, I want to recognize our sponsors. First, Jefferson County Health, <coughs> Jefferson County Citizens for Healthcare Access for their leadership, and especially Jennifer Taylor, who has done a lot to make this forum possible. Healthcare for All of Washington is also a sponsor and would like to uh, take in, you to take information with them. I think that's going to be available later or is available on the uh, table outside. And um, I'm certain that Patrick would be quite interested in talking to you after the forum if you're interested in joining that effort. The League of Women Voters of Clallam County is also a sponsor, and I'd like Marsha Rowdy to stand. Where are you, Marsha? Please stand. You're too short to just raise your hand. <laughs> I want, the reason I point her out is because she has brought with her our information for our league, also membership applications, and just to let you know, you don't have to be a Clown County resident or a woman to join, so keep that in mind. She also brought voter registration, so if you haven't voted, haven't registered to vote, you can do it today, right? Uh, just to let you know, Clallam County League of Women Voters took a position to support single payer in 2008. So it's been a long haul for that group as well. Uh, I do have copies of their position statement. If anyone is interested, you can get them from me afterwards. Our last sponsor who deserves special recognition is Kimber Unitarian Universalist Fellowship for allowing this forum to take place in this sanctuary and for providing excellent technical support and help to get all of these devices set up. That's kind of a big deal. Any of you have put on forums, you know that if things go wrong, that's where they go wrong. So you need the expertise and the help. So a uh, big thank you to the fellowship for their support and their sponsorship. I'm going to give you a free test, and then you'll be tested afterwards. Two questions. Please raise your hand if you feel, know, or think that you have a good understanding of single payer. Raise your hand if you have a good understanding. Okay? Please raise your hand if you feel, think, or know that you have a good understanding of the Affordable Care Act or ACA. <laughs> that would be three. Okay. So, panel, your work is before you. <laughs> We have two intentions today. One is to ask Representative Theringer to listen, and in doing so, we hope to encourage, persuade, convince him, and also Representative Vandeweg, 
to co-sponsor state legislation that would allow Washington State the option under the ACA of becoming a single payer state. Now you'll notice on the back of your agenda, I've listed the number <coughs> and the uh, link to the current bill, bill number 1098, House Bill 10, 1095, I'm sorry, is that wrong? 85, I'm a little bit dyslexic. And what is the Senate bill number? Okay, now that you know that January 12th, it doesn't matter, so you don't have to put a lot of time into your memory, and although you can look it up and find out what the bill says. So on January 12th, new bills will be come then. So this bill doesn't carry over a new bill, as I understand it, Steve, correctly, do I? That, that there will be a new bill, so the effort now is to get co-sponsors for those bills to go forward. Our second intention is to inform. That's to inform all of us that are here about single payer option and the Washington Health Security Trust and the Affordable Care Act to the extent we can. Steve is gonna start us off with a few brief opening comments and then take his, and then we will ask him to comment at the end of the panel. Uh, for those of you who don't know Steve, and I don't know if anyone doesn't know Steve, uh, Steve was first elected to the legislature in 2010 to represent the 24th legislative district and was just recently elected to his third term. Steve has a long record of community service, volunteerism, and small business experience. He is a former Clown County Commissioner and a small business owner. Among other assignments, Steve currently serves on the Health Care and Wellness Committee and holds legislative appointments to the Joint Select Committee on Health Care Reform Implementation and Joint Legislative Executive Committee on Aging and Disability. Steve, brief comment? Get us started. Thanks, Bertha, and welcome everybody here as a program. Um, it's great to see so many folks here. As Bertha mentioned, to start it out, I think I was going to have coffee with Patrick. Yeah. And uh, then it was a forum with maybe a few people, and then now it's a video forum, which is all great. I think it really speaks to the interest and the energy around this issue. So uh, I'm just glad that I could fit in, you know, an afternoon instead of just a 15-minute coffee into my schedule. So um, just a little bit update on uh, we. You know, on our biennial cycle, right, in the legislature, we just had an election, so there will be some changes uh, on committee assignments, and uh, uh, so what I'm on now, I, I hope to continue to serve on, but I'm on the finance committee, I'm vice chair of the finance committee, and that committee sort of is, is tasked to come up with revenue to meet our challenges with the state. Uh, I'm on the appropriations committee, which is takes that revenue and then decides where it's going to be spent. And I'm also on the health care committee, and as Bertha mentioned, I co-chair a joint select committee on aging and disabilities. And uh, because I'm co-chairing that, I'm no longer on the uh, health care oversight committee. So, um, and I, my hope is to just continue in those roles in the next biennium in this next session. Uh, so health care is obviously a very important issue for, I think, the state, for the nation, but particularly for us here on the North Peninsula um, in the 24th Legislative District, partly because we're rural and partly because of our demographic. Uh, we're the oldest, the 24th District, which is Jefferson County, Clown County, and parts of Grace Harbor, is the oldest di district in the state. We average around 25, 26% of our population is over 65, where Seattle and the rest of the state, Seattle, for example, is around 16 or 17%. The other part of, of as we, a lot of us know, um, in when the balanced budget agreement was put in in 94, it locked in medical rates within Medicare and Medicaid and a lot of reimbursement structures. And at that point, Washington had a very efficient healthcare system. And so we got locked into very low prices in those reimbursement rates. 
And that's particularly, that's multiplied in rural areas. So it's very hard, very challenging for our providers to maintain Medicare and Medicaid services at the reimbursement rates they receive. And I think that's one of the issues I'm interested in hearing about today from the panel is what would single payer or the trust do to address that issue? Because that is a huge issue now and it's an ongoing challenge for us to be able to meet, uh, have rates that generate enough providers. I think a lot of you know, it's very difficult, certainly in Collin County, it's very difficult for people to get doctors, primary care doctors. They just do not take uh, Medicare or Medicaid patients because it's about a 70 cent, 80 cent return on the dollar of service. So that is that I think is a real challenge no matter what system we have, is how do we maintain access or improve access really. I think the other issue is cost. There's always a challenge with cost. As a lot of you know, one of the advantages of a single payer is it eliminates a lot of the administrative costs, but getting from here to there is a real challenge. And, um, and right now, I think the other thing I'd uh, mention is, as folks know, there's just a lot of folks falling through the cracks with, um, with the Affordable Care Act and with Washington's approach to that, which is the Health Finder and the Basic Health Plan and Apple Health for Kids. Although we're probably in the top five states in the nation in how we've rolled out the Affordable Care Act, uh, we still have real challenges um, and, and people getting access and, and getting coverage. So uh, I'm interested to hear what the panel has to say and what people think about trying to address some of those basic issues as we move forward and meeting our healthcare needs. So glad to be here and um, thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, Steve. In addition to Steve, we have Sam of the panel, which is the set the stage for our dialogue today which will include your comments and, and questions later on in the program. <coughs> We're going to start with Dr. Ken Faber. Dr. Ken Faber is a practicing physician with Group Health, I think, in Paulsgrove, is that correct? Where are you? Well, right now, in local Group Health in Silverdale. Ah, okay, Silverdale. Okay, he's a longtime advocate for single payer health care and a member of Physicians for a National Health Plan. Ken. Thank you. Um, sort of an unofficial PNHP representative. I'm not part of the hierarchy, but. Uh, Does it sound I, good? Can you hear me? No, no, no. no. I think we need you closer to your own. Okay. Got any better? Yep. So I've been a longtime PNHP member, um, but far longer an advocate of single payer. Sweeping health reform in this country. I kind of had a ringside seat on the whole show for since 1975 when I started medical school. So uh, I could regale you with stories all day long about, about the injustices and the problems I've seen. Um, but anyway, I, I think we're moving ahead, and I think single payer is a pretty good answer to things. And for all those people who felt like they understood it, I was really pleased to see as many hands go up as, as they did. I think you're a pretty informed audience. but. PNHP, the National Health Program, um, just the Western Washington chapter just released a 12-minute video that sort of summarizes the, not only the, the, the basics of a single payer and broad brushstrokes, but also some specific comments with regard to the state of Washington and the, and the WISC, the, the, the Washington Health Securities Trust, which is proposed as a mechanism, a legislative mechanism to, to uh, put single payer into effect. So, I think rather than uh, doing anything else, let's just start the video and, uh, and then I'll follow up with a few slides and comments and uh, um, we'll go from there. Stockholm, Sweden, a beautiful place with a lot of water, just like Seattle. And it's up north like Seattle, with long light days in the summer and long dark nights in the winter. There are just about as many people in Stockholm as there are in Seattle, and Sweden's total population is comparable to the state of Washington's. 
These are Swedes. They're a lot like us. They love their smartphones, they love coffee, Hollywood blockbusters, Facebook, no big surprises. They work hard to get ahead, and they worry about their kids' future. But unlike us, one thing they don't have to worry about is health insurance. They don't have to think about bronze, silver, or gold, about HSAs or copays or deductibles, percentage co-insurance, out-of-pocket maximums. They don't have to worry about losing their insurance if they lose their jobs. They don't have to worry if the hospital they are rushed to is in their network, and they don't have reimbursement forms to deal with. They don't have to worry if they're covered or not, because everyone here is covered just like all the people in France, and England, and Germany, Spain, Iceland, Norway, Belgium, Italy, Israel. The same goes for all the people in Japan, and South Korea, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the list goes on. In fact, it's just in Chile, Mexico, Turkey, and the United States, out of 34 industrialized nations where citizens live without the security and peace of mind of universal health care. Other countries see health care as a human right, a necessary public service, like police departments, fire departments, and public schools. Everyone is covered. No one is left out. It saves lives, and it also saves money. You see, we have, by far, the most expensive healthcare system in the world. More than 17% of our nation's total spending is on healthcare, and that number is going up. That's 50% more than other industrialized nations. The average cost per hospital day in the United States is $4,287, three times as much as the second most expensive country, Australia, and five or six times the cost of a European hospital. The average hospital and physician cost of a hip replacement in the United States is more than $40,000. The same procedure in the United Kingdom is less than 12,000, and it's less than 10,000 in Switzerland. <clears throat> and childbirth, the cost of conventional delivery in the United States is double the cost in Switzerland, and nearly three times the cost in France and the UK. The same is true for caesarean delivery. The list goes on and on driving up the cost of insurance and the out-of-pocket. Now, having the most expensive health care system in the world might seem okay if we had the best health care results in the world, but we just don't. When it comes to life expectancy, we rank 26th out of 34 industrialized nations. 45,000 deaths of U.S. adults under the age of 65 each year are tied to the lack of health insurance. And looking at infant mortality, we rank 31st, losing infants at a higher rate than 30 other countries. And 42 million people in the United States have no health insurance at all. Here's another way to look at the high cost of health care in the United States. Illness and medical bills are the leading cause of bankruptcy in our country, linked to more than 60% of all bankruptcy cases filed. Every 15 seconds, another American's life is disrupted by medical bankruptcy. And three quarters of these people had health insurance at the start of their illness. This is not good. 
It's embarrassing. But we can fix it. We can fix it. Think about it. Up until 1920, women did not have the right to vote. We fixed that. And up until 1965, America had no health care program for the elderly. The cost of their health care crushed middle class families. But we fixed that with Medicare. Now it's time to fix health care for the rest of us to control costs, improve coverage, and bring peace of mind. The right way to do that is expanded and improved Medicare for all. Medicare is not new. With almost 50 years of history behind it, it's tried and tested. It provides health care, hospitalization, and doctor visits to <coughs> Americans 65 and older nationwide. It pays private practice doctors and hospitals for their services, and it does not take a profit. It replaces insurance companies and their complex web of policies with one single payer, Medicare. This reduces complexity, slashes administrative costs, streamlines payments, and works just fine for 50 million senior and disabled Americans. The idea of better Medicare for all is not new. It's been around for years. Physicians for a national health program have advocated this since 1987. It's what other countries do. But proposed legislation gets repeatedly sidetracked or ignored by congressional leaders. Things are different now, though. The costs of health care and insurance are getting just too high rising much faster each year than the salaries of hardworking Americans. The right thing to do would be to act at the national level, passing H.R. 676, Expanded and Improved Medicare for All. But that could take a long time to happen. Luckily, we live in a democracy where individual states can move ahead on their own, and one state, the state of Vermont, is doing just that. Vermont is using a provision in the Affordable Care Act that allows states to move forward in 2017 with federal funding to build statewide programs, programs that replace insurance companies, improving coverage, and controlling costs. This is the state of Washington, a beautiful, bountiful place. Up north, innovative. We take a cooperative approach to solving big problems. Vermont may be the first state to move forward to fix this problem, but it looks like Washington and Oregon could be next. We already have elected officials on the right side of this issue. Like Seattle Congressman Jim McDermott, one of the nation's leading advocates of Medicare for All, and our representative in the other Washington for more than 20 years. <coughs> Plus, he's a doctor. And in Olympia, Senator Karen Kaiser on the Health Care Committee and Representative Eileen Cody on the House Health Care and Wellness Committee. We can fix this at the national level with expanded and improved Medicare for all. And that's what H.R. 676 is all about but we'll probably get there sooner by following Vermont's lead, watching their progress mm -hmm. as one of the first states to set up our own single-payer system. In Olympia, that's what Senate Bill 5224 is all about, and House Bill 1085, with a growing list of senators and representatives on board. 2017 is not as far away as you might think. It takes time to spread the word, to get people to think this through. Imagine the citizens of Washington State with the same peace of mind as citizens of virtually every other country in the industrialized world.
being able to sleep at night without worry that a medical illness could lead to an economic disaster that destroys your family's future. It's time to fix this. Share this video with friends and family. And visit Healthcare for All Washington to see what you can do. It's time to fix our healthcare system. Let's do it together. It's an easy act to follow. I mean, it pretty well says it all. And I think uh, this just literally came out, and uh, I just think it was masterfully well done because uh, you know the, the case is the case is so obvious. Really, when you spell it out like this, um, you have to ask yourself, well, who wouldn't be in favor of this? Well, the people who are making a lot of money right now are not going to be in favor of it. Um, the insurance companies aren't going to be in favor of it. So it's uh, it should be such a slam dunk. So that's where that's where citizen input and legislative input is going to come in handy because it's it's going to be the only way. It's not going to come from the top down. Um, I uh, I have a few slides here just sort of say the first few slides are about basically about making the case for single payer and I'll sort of breeze through those because that's already been done. But I want to talk about a few of the basic provisions that are proposed for the WIST program um, and uh, and then maybe maybe at the end. Tell a couple of stories. I did have the opportunity to practice in New Zealand for a couple of sessions, actually, um, in the last few years. And uh, as you saw, it is a single payer system, and uh, so I can speak pretty authoritatively to what that is like to, to be in a system where everyone is in, everyone does have insurance. And it, it wasn't perfect. There, you know, people grumbled about it. I was, I was telling Matt before the before um, the session today that uh, occasionally people would complain to me about their health system. People love to. They complain about the wait time, or they complain about this, or they complain about that, or they didn't like the doctor. And I'd let this go on for a minute, and I'd just say, okay, you know where I'm from. I'll trade you. <laughs> End of complaints. <okay. laughs> far from, you know, I'll just segue for a minute here. You know, far from the propaganda that you hear that, you know, we have the world's best health system, we have, we're the, you know, we're number one, that kind of stuff. I mean, as you saw, we are not number one. And not only are we not number one, but we're pretty much an international laughing stock. I'll just be blunt about it. I can't tell you how many Kiwis I know came up to me and said, you know, I've, I've been to the States. I'm, I was a ski bum in the States. I hitchhiked around. And I wouldn't go back. There are plenty of places like the States I could go to Canada because I don't want to get injured. Seriously. I have a friend who's a New Zealander who lives in Chicago for inexplicable reasons. Uh, but her mother in New Zealand has some congestive heart failure. She has to buy a fifteen hundred dollar two week accessory policy to just come to visit her daughter in Chicago in case she gets sick. And so, guess how often she comes? You know, it, it, people are kind of wise with this, and they say, well, "Why? Why would we do this? Why are you doing this?" Is also the question. So, anyway, um, just a few a few quick slides here. This is always one of my favorite quotes. This is pretty well summarized. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what we're doing. This is, uh, you know, I guess. I don't know if that works or not. But anyway, we're trying to get to 
we're trying to get our teeth taken care of, right? We're trying to get, metaphorically, we're trying to get our teeth brushed. And, you know, we've got some tools to do that, but you know, well, this is kind of kind of how we're going about it. Um, which, you know, I, there are a lot of dollar signs in all those little, little steps too that, that, that don't show up in the cartoon. And you know, it's it's complicated, right? I don't know if anybody remember your algebra. That's actually a simplification process. <laughs> You know, we, we did have one American who did understand that simplification was probably a good thing, but he was from another century. <laughs> okay, so we've been through this. I mean, <clears throat> the numbers, the 45,000 excess death number, actually, that's on the low side. It's felt to be even higher. It's such an abstraction. It's a, wait a minute, 55,000 people a year die excess from, from black health access and over intervention and everything else. Um, yeah. That's real. Now, I mean, to, to put it in perspective, if we had a if we had a hundred white body jets crash every year, do you think we'd do something about it? I, I suspect we would. Um, waste and fraud would get the universal coverage. And the, the movie captured this better than my slides can. I mean our, our, our data, our, our statistics are terrible. Um, GDP now is almost pushing nineteen percent over the seventy percent threshold. I mean, that's a big chunk of an economy. <coughs> Um, drivers have crossed litigation, unrestrained, no, no collective negotiation with the pharmaceutical industry at all. Um, just as a sidebar, in New Zealand, every prescription costs three dollars. Three dollars. Now, it was from a limited, it was from a negotiated formulary. You know, if you wanted a third generation erectile dysfunction drug, you had to pay for it. You know, you didn't get, didn't get that for three bucks. But, yeah, anyway. Um, and even after the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented, and when it ever is, it's still estimated we'll have 30 million uninsured people. So this is, uh, at the very best, a bridge um, program that, that really doesn't seem to have a sustainable component to it, in my opinion. We've seen this, again, my, near and dear to my heart is New Zealand. We spent three times what they do. Um, outcomes are the same. In fact, better for, for infant mortality, perinatal mortality, and so on. And uh, again, we are not number one. This is just five, seven systems compared by the Commonwealth Fund. So aggregate statistics about this sort of stuff, and uh, we're number seven. Okay, so the West, what is it? It's basically a single financing entity. You saw, you saw the, the graphic on the movie about single payer. It just eliminates all the, all the other pathways. The proposal is who's eligible? Everybody. Everybody's in. You know, I, I can't emphasize enough how I've talked to patients who are overwhelmed, they're sick, uh, they've had an accident, they're out of work, and then they're being asked to sort of, quote, exercise individual responsibility or whatever it's felt that they should be doing to optimize and fine tune their. You know, to make some sense of the chaos of healthcare in this, in this system. It, it doesn't work. If everybody's already in the pool, they don't have to worry about that. It's done, they're taken care of. Um, exceptions under WIST would be federal employees with certain federal programs that already have federal funding and exemptions will be negotiated to hopefully channel those funds into the WIST. But that is complicated and yet to be worked out. So what is covered? Basically health services, eventually dental, not right away, but that's, that's that's been felt to be a necessary component. I agree with that, and, and it looks like that they will do that. Prescriptions through a negotiated drug formulary. Trust me, uh, if and when that's implemented, there will be howls of pain from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and they will fight it tooth and nail. Uh, but don't let them. The mental health care, long-term care, and diagnostics. Also, LNI funding and community health centers. And the hook on community health centers is that reflects a increased commitment to primary care, which it doesn't matter whose data you look at, what country you look at, primary care is a driver of cost savings and efficacy and access. I, I, I'm always skeptical of one-size-fits-all solutions to problems, but primary care is a big solution to a lot of the problems we have in this country. World Health Organization says the optimal primary care base for health system is about 40%. In the U.S., we have 18% if you count some people on the fringes. So it's, it, that's the driver of access. In New Zealand, for example, the highest paid, some of the highest paid physicians, uh, 
were rural GPs. Follow the money. <laughs> we had two students rotate through, through the clinic when I was there for six months, and they were, they were brilliant. They were top, top drawer, top caliber people. No, and they weren't becoming ophthalmologists, and they weren't becoming in interventional radiologists, and they weren't becoming neurosurgeons, they were becoming rural GPs. And they were paid to do it. So, you know, you get what you pay for. And, you know, I've, I've been in the trenches of primary care. I see people demoralized. They can't get paid, they're in a rural setting. There is no, you know, everybody's poor. I, I worked in rural South Carolina for seven years. Uh, I had 30% no pay rate in my private practice. My payer of choice was Medicare. Yes, it was 85% of usual and customary, but I got it 48 hours later. You know, if somebody happened to have Cigna or Aetna or God knows what, you know, I got, I got my money 60 days later on a trivial claim, and whoops, it was denied because I didn't dot the I and page four you know, for my $50 claim. You know, there's a pattern. Anyway, Medicare was my pair of choice. And, you know, people think government doesn't work. Well, it, it worked fine. Uh, it just, uh, you just have to give it a shot. Anyway, funding for the WIST would be all, uh, an employer pool with a, um, based on payroll. All residents would have a flat rate. Um, Medicare, Medicaid be beneficiaries, sort of a sliding scale there. Alcohol taxes, cigarette taxes, tobacco settlement monies are substantial, and that would be part of it. That would be thrown in the pot. Federal funds after the waivers are obtained, and then the co pays. Um, <clears throat> I mean, is this perfect in my opinion? No, it's not. I mean, the, the best functioning single payer systems funded out of general revenue, which means income taxes, which we're so allergic to, we won't be funding it that way in our, in our society. So there, there are other mechanisms, but they're more convoluted. Um, Co-pays can, can be a barrier to access. Ironically, New Zealand had $30 co-pays and people complain bitterly about it. Um, so that wasn't a perfect system either. And payment for providers will be negotiated. The big, the big thing here is the hospitals and providers would remain in the private sector. They would not be employees of WIS. This isn't a socialist program. This isn't like the British National Health Service where you're an employee of the government as a physician. Um, you'd be in a private practice. And, if you want to talk about business solutions, for example, in New Zealand, the private the practices were private practices, and there was actually more entrepreneurial energy and flexibility there, simply because doctors could go where the need was, or where the, or stay in the community they grew up in and returned to, because they could get paid. If they went to a, a poor area, they would get paid, and it would be a, it was a great actually a great income inequality leveler because one of the many drivers of income inequality in this country is lack of access in poor areas. It just becomes a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And uh, global budgets with healthcare uh, facilities and hospitals. To be honest with you, I don't know the details. It still has to be hashed out legislatively, but um, the money is there. So there are no restrictions on who you can see or where you can go. There's no restrictions on employers augmenting the WIST but the goal is to make WIST so inexpensive, efficient, and compelling that why would anybody want to do that? And no restriction on Medicare recipients using their WIST coverage for secondary. So basically, this is from the Healthcare for All Washington summary statement. It's basically just a, a, a regurgitation of what insurance should be. Insurance is expanding a pool to a size that, that if something happens to a given individual, it's not a big hit. Um, we, on the other hand, have had cherry picking, exclusion, decisions, all kinds of nonsense, um, which, which is part of the reason we're having this conversation, I think. So what is WIST? It's simple, fair, accountable, affordable, universal, everybody in, and, and smart. I mean, there might just be another way. It's that easy. <laughs> besides, our friends up north, this is from the Olympics a couple of years ago. So I, just, I love this slide. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll be around later on if you want to ask any questions about the experience with single parent in New Zealand. Or, uh, and actually, actually, before I show the mic, one, one, one last thing. I hear from people all the time, well, this is the United States, it's complicated, we're big, we can't do this. And the, the example of Taiwan yeah, has to be front and center. In 1989, Taiwan had a 56% insured rate. In other words, 44% of the population was uninsured. They were squabbling about it for years. They brought in a, a health economist named 
William Shaw from the Harvard School of Public Health. He went over there, and nine months later, they implemented a single-player program across the board, across the country, fund, funded from the general revenues. And three years later, 96% of the population was covered. Their health outcomes became, their, their cervical cancer rates dropped, their breast cancer rates dropped, mammography screening rates improved dramatically, hepatitis B vaccination programs were implemented, hepatocellular carcinoma was prevented. I mean, it was, they hit it out of the park. It's just not that hard. You just have to remove the obstructions. Anyway. Our next panelist is Matt Reddy. Uh, Matt Reddy is a Jefferson Healthcare Public Hospital Commissioner. He's an activist, writer, and also a strong advocate for single payer healthcare. Matt. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Representative Derringer, for joining us. Um, there's a lot of work to do if we want to get single payer. and. Uh, so um, we really need everyone um, to be as informed as possible because there's not just our community, our county, but our neighboring county um, as well as then uh, across the state. We need a healthy dialogue on this issue. So I'm going to talk briefly about some of the threats to rural uh, health care and how it relates to single payer. And it's pretty simple. Money. And this is, this is all about money. And the reason we don't have single payer is about money. The money problem is that U.S. healthcare costs are out of control, which we've been talking about, but this is getting to a, a crisis level, and the pressure is building to try to figure out how to reduce these costs. Um, it's actually a side note that our health outcomes are far worse. The real driving factor here um, in our legislative bodies, I believe, is just the money part of this. And this is just another way of showing it, stuff we've already seen. We spend twice as much as other countries, and we're way down on health outcomes. I kind of like this picture that shows that also. It shows life expectancy uh, going up, and it has um, the cost per capita is going to the right, and you see all the other industrialized nations doing something fundamentally different than us over here in the US with our multi-payer system. So the second part of this money problem is that the only solution that, for some reason, we're allowed to talk about and that are actually in practice to reduce costs is to pay hospitals and providers less. That is basically the mechanism. Um, and what that means is basically Medicare and Medicaid payments get tighter and <coughs> demands on the hospitals and providers go up. So you're asked to do more, and you're asked to not get paid more. So this is hitting hospitals and providers that don't have the best payer rates. Um, it's hitting them the hardest, and that means rural healthcare. It's not hitting urban hospitals or uh, providers that have great, um, or they have patients with really nice insurance. It doesn't hit them the same. In fact, big healthcare systems and specialist providers are making very nice profits in the current system. So the results of this, um, so the results have actually been pushing on rural um, primary care providers for the last 20 years. And what you've seen, you've actually seen this right in our county, if you've been here a while, the last 20 years, has everyone seen independent rural uh, primary care providers stopping being independent? They stopped and a lot of them had to become employed by um, our hospital because the numbers no longer added up to a point where they could stay in business. And they basically, many of them said they would have to leave the area and go practice somewhere else. And organizations like Jefferson Healthcare, and this happened in lots of public hospital districts uh, around the state, they just started employing <coughs> the providers to keep them in our area because we need them here. So you see independent rural primary care providers are, they're, they're um, and greatly reduced. So it hit the rural areas um, first, but it's actually going across the country now, and you can see um, in this chart shows the number of independent uh, primary care providers is, is dropping, plummeting, um, while everyone is becoming employed. So that's the first place it impacted. Now, what's it doing to rural hospitals? Well, you can see 
see right here, this is just in the uh, USA Today uh, article, a study came out, 43 rural hospitals uh, across the US have closed since 2010. That's because, again, rural hospitals have, in this system, uh, they're, not, they're not in a position to make it a, a nice margin because of the pay rates. Urban hospitals um, are making money in this system, and so they're, they're the ones that are extremely washed out. That's actually a picture of the U.S. These are all the hospitals that have, uh, rural hospitals that have shut down since 2010. You'll see it actually has not hit uh, the Pacific Northwest yet, uh, but I'm concerned it will over the next five to ten years if we do not start making a healthy transition. It's also hitting the states that did not expand Medicaid, um, and we're lucky to be in a state that did. Now, Jefferson Healthcare is not in financial crisis, and we're not on the verge of anything like that happening. But that doesn't mean that this wave isn't coming towards us, and it's time to think about this and get ahead of it. We don't need to wait for a crisis. We need a modern, rationally designed healthcare system. <clears throat> so what would happen if we actually implemented single payer um, or something like uh, Washington Health Security Trust? What they do, instead of some hospitals and some providers getting a huge um, chunk of their charges reimbursed because they have better payers, instead you negotiate down the cost to a sensible level. You say an appendectomy is, and this is in France, is instead of $13,000, it's $4,000. You rationally study what does it actually cost to do this healthcare service, then you say to your hospitals and providers, where you're going to get reimbursed cost plus, plus a little margin so that you actually have enough operating capital to reinvest in your business. It's just rational across the board. It basically flattens the playing field between urban hospitals and rural hospitals. And it puts them on the same team because now they're negotiating together to try to get reasonable reimbursement. We're not on the same team right now. Right now, this is the healthcare battle. Um, it's urban hospitals, rural hospitals, specialist providers, uh, primary care providers, and insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. Everyone just fighting for their piece of money. So, and in fact, I believe they're actually lobbying against one another. And I think if the single payer debate really comes out, you, it, that'll become really clear. You'll start to see that um, all hospital districts in this state are not going to equally be in favor of single payer because some are making a, a lot of profit. And there's also this constant game of hot potato of pushing uninsured and poorly insured patients back and forth. And you can actually see that happening between our counties um, right here on the peninsula. So what would change? Again, we implement the single payer system or this uh, at the state level or the national level. And now the focus is now about how do you get reasonable reimbursement? I mean, there's still gonna be fights. There's still gonna be a lot of struggle. There's still gonna be special interests every step of the way trying to um, draft the bill in a way that benefits them. But I believe it'll unify healthcare. It'll unify hospitals and providers to try to make this system work for everyone. So this is a metaphor that, to me, really, I like to simplify everything into metaphors. So, I'm going to show you more. <laughs> to me, multi-payer and single-payer is like comparing wooden old sailing ships to modern metal um, vessels. Okay, this is the old way, using wooden ships. And in fact, more accurate is it's like a fleet of vessels we have, a bunch of wooden ships, and maybe one nice metal sh um, ship for people that have amazing insurance in this country. So this fleet. You know, some, there's a couple modern ones, many uh, barely seaworthy, and some sinking and leaving people drowning. It's too weak and costly, and no one, no sensible scientist would say, we're going to build a fleet of ships out of wood to do any real modern work to, you know, in this day and age. Everyone knows, you build a ship out of metal, and plastic, and you use an engine, and don't rely on wind power. That's how you get the size and strength you need to get everyone into the system. So, what did we do? We did the ACA, which is just a new version of a wooden sailing ship. And it is not going to hold everything. That was what we did. So, we need to 
get from this, this old paradigm to this new paradigm. And this is not going to be easy. This transition is going to be difficult. And we need to recognize it is, you can build a bad metal ship, right? It is possible <laughs> to do something, you know, we could start this debate on single payer and trying to do this in Washington State, and it could be a disaster if we allow the interests that want to force us to keep wood in there and throw a few sails on it. I mean, they will, because there are interests that love the current system. And so it's not like we're gonna just flip a switch and get there. We have to watch this from the beginning. We need to watch every step of the way. How are we designing this? And the, the Washington Health Security Trust Bill, is, it's just a framework. It's a start of a blueprint. And if this gets out of committee and gets developed, it's gonna be changed, there's gonna be interest trying to do things, we need to watch it the whole way or else we're just gonna have something like the ACA, which is again, sort of a complicated uh, monster. It does some good things, but it's not what we need. We need to watch, you know, we need to study what other countries are doing. Every, all these different industrialized countries have different versions. You know, you might, they're like different styles of ship. We need to see which style we wanna go with and really use rational thinking to design the system and try to hold back the special interests and the propaganda talk um, that tries to dominate this debate. And I believe a part of this will be helped with more leadership from local elected officials. Healthcare affects everyone in our county, so why not have every elected representative, not just our state and federal ones, talking about this? Let every elected uh, representative talk about it. It's not that hard to understand. You know, as my old boss used to say, it's not rocket science, really. It is actually, if you want to understand the current system, the multi-payer system, but comparing single payer to, um, to what we have now, it's really a simple comparison. That video explained it really well. So ask your elected officials, or if you're an elected official here, and I see a few here, um, you know, take a little time to understand it. And if you engage at the local level and have local politicians talking about this and having local dialogue, you can sort of help prevent corporations and the ones that sort of control the biggest parts of the media from controlling the discussion. You know, let's just have real discussions um, at the local level. And so I would encourage every local official, city council, county commissioners, um, as well as public hospital boards, and I encourage you to join me in, in this call. Ask everyone, why not consider a resolution, a little bit of time learning about this, and making us, you know, starting a discussion and considering a resolution, encouraging the pursuit of single payer at the state level. I think this will help educate people and it will actually help support our state politicians um, who have, will have a serious, serious uh, struggle to get this to work and get this to happen. Yeah. Um, and I believe if we do this, we can get, this is be my design of what the healthcare system would look like if you made a shit model, but there are other versions that would be acceptable to me. <laughs> having worked mostly with knee and hip implant programs. He has operated and owned businesses and helped hospitals reduce millions of dollars of operating costs. He lives in Port Angeles and is a member of the League of Women Voters and our Access to Healthcare Committee. Patrick. You think my, <coughs> my voice is just about shock, so thank God for my folks. <laughs> you think by the time somebody's 71, they'd be able to get their resume on more than one page, but I still can't do it. <laughs> anyway, that's who I am. I'm all those things, or have been all those things sometime in my life. I think I have a time to look at that. See that thing right in front of you there, Ken? Would you lift that little round thing off and unfurl that piece of paper right there and drop it down? Five years and three months ago, this washed out ad appeared in the PDN. And it was a support with, uh, of, guess what, single payer health care, signed by a whole bunch of people in this room. Steve, you're on there, I'm on there, uh, Bertha's on there, Tommy, Mary, a whole bunch of 
are on there. And I've even highlighted all the people that I know are here today who are on there, but there's a bunch of you who are on there as well. My point in showing you that thing is the choir is reassembled today. Here we are. Uh, we're talking about single payer, but five years and three months have passed since in 09 we all signed that thing. So my goals today, Representative Theringer, I think you're my favorite person in our legislature. If you're not, you're bloody close. <laughs> my opinionated goal for you in this meeting is that you leave here fully understanding what our options are and that you understand this bill. I think you understand it pretty well. I'm not sure you know where all the, all the money is hidden, uh, but I'll try and help you with that. I believe that this bill is self-funding. Yet I hear, I hear all the time that it's not. We want desperately for you to co-sponsor this and then go out and maybe evangelize to four or five converts and get them to co-sponsor it. We desperately need that. For the rest of you guys out here, I would like very much uh, if you would gain the confidence to go out and talk to skeptics and business owners about this subject. So to do that, uh, you need to, in your heart, know, I've been passing out my slides, uh, which I appreciate. Uh, in your heart, I want you to know that this is good for business, families, and government who actually occupy both sides of the debate, if you think about it. Follow the money. Anybody with gray hair has heard that term before? Enough said. And I would love for you to have a plan on how you're going to talk to some different people. So today you've seen a fabulous video, best one I've ever seen on showing this to people. Uh, the, the YouTube address is on that handout that you're getting from me right now, but I'll ask you not to look at it to fill it, but that is on there. It's time to arm you with a bunch of numbers, uh, and I'm going to ask you to look at cost as a strategy. We've already heard people talk about cost. The biggest barrier we've got is cost. This is all about cost. It's not about access. It's no longer about quality. We've got great quality. We don't have good enough access to it. But think cost. Everybody should have what I call an elevator speech. If you run into somebody you didn't expect to run into, you should have a three minute steal somewhere in your head to where you can address this with them and get into the next step. Gonna have to practice that and think about it, but you should have a two-minute elevator speech. I think we're going to answer the 18 questions on the back of your agenda before we start questions and answers. At least that's a goal today. I would love for you to leave here with more hope than you came in. Okay, business. We built our health care system around business. Whether we did it smartly or not, I can't say. I think that was probably a dumb decision, but at the time it was a good decision because we didn't have it. It occurred in the 40s post-war. Now, there's a lot of business out, out there that pay 15% of their payroll for health care. Their employees pay a bunch for health care, and between them they get a catastrophic plan that frankly isn't very good. So all that money is spent, you still got to pay for your own health care, unless you get really sick. That's not what we signed up for. Those business owners are pretty angry. They don't know where the money is going. They don't, but they're angry at somebody. We need to help tell them who and what they should do about it. Many are bailing out. They're terrified of government. They think government's the enemy. Government right now is the solution on this one. We need their support. They've got a lot of friends. I carry a hit list of CEOs in my iPhone. It's the top 20 corporations, employers, uh, on the West Coast, and Boeing's in there, Microsoft's in there, someday I want to sit with Howard Schultz at Starbucks and tell him that they should support this. We need some loud, wealthy people on our side. We really need them. Okay, the gap. The reimbursement game. Poor hospitals like Jefferson and, and Olympic. I don't know how these guys do it. Tony's here in the audience, Matt's here. You guys are walking such a fine line. Everybody's playing the reimbursement game. You got what I call the blues, that's like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, or Aetna, Regents, etc. And you got Medicare, Medicaid. That gap looks like this right now. It's getting wider and wider and wider every time Medicare takes a cut. The other stuff seems to go up a little bit. What choice do these hospitals have but to chase the top line? That's full of problems, okay? It's a system that's just totally built on overpayment. Staffs are growing, buildings are being put up. I don't know how many buildings we have uh, for Jefferson right now. And I'm not being critical, they've got to do that to stay alive. 
all of it is unsustainable and it's just devastating to the businesses and some families. Okay, enough of the problem. Providers, bless them. Every time a big hospital eats a little hospital and I read the news release on it, it's always to increase efficiency. <laughs> Baloney, it's to increase negotiating position with insurers and employers. Every time. I don't think I've seen an exception to that yet. They're buying up medical practices. We've heard that. They're building like crazy. It's hard to go to Seattle and look at a hospital and not see two or three cranes on the roof. Do they need to do that sometimes? Do they? Hospitals now pretty much charge what they want to charge. The old negotiation stuff is history. They'll sit down with an insurer and tell them, hey, if you want to keep selling insurance in Washington, uh, this is kind of what uh, you're going to pay us. Then they turn around and tell the employer what that person is going to pay them. Uh, Negotiation is pretty much a thing of the past. This one's terrifying. Middle management in hospital. Now you got people called service line directors and directors of marketing, all kinds of middle management staffing is being added to chase that top line. And that one, that one's bad. Business offices. I think they're. I'm guessing uh, there's like 18 to 20 people in the business office at Olympic now. What goes on in business offices today is coding and upcoding and just chasing claims. And uh, big hospitals have literally hundreds of people doing that. It's not necessary. This one's pointed, and I'm an opinionated old guy, but Providence just passed 25 management people whose salaries are north of a million bucks. Now, Providence goes from Anchorage to Burbank. But there's 25, and I'm not talking about the medical folks, I'm talking about management. 25 people with salaries up there. Should they be doing that? No. What do you do with your second $500,000? Okay. This is, this is Noonan's list. I can't base this totally on data. I worked in the industry long enough to, to, to build this list, and I have continued to tailor this list. Insurance industry used to be on the top of my of a bad guys list. Now it's large hospitals and healthcare systems. I hate, hated to see that happen because when I raised it to number one, I was working for a large hospital system. Insurance industry, bless their hearts, have slipped to number two. <laughs> Pharmaceutical, you know all about those guys. Three, the folks who made my titanium or whatever it is need are number four. But that includes uh, uh, in all kinds of implants, cardiac, uh, spine, otherwise. Specialist physicians and surgeons, Ken talked about them. Again, what do you do with your second 500K these days? Uh, there's a lot of surgeons, ophthalmologists, neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists that are well above a million dollars. The lobbying industry, more later. A lot of you may have come in here thinking that now practice attorneys uh, are close to the top of the list. Sorry, they run a distant seven. Or, should they be on the list? Oh yeah. Okay, this one's pointed. Uh, I just want, the only reason I put that up there is so you know how big a business this is now. Now keep in mind Providence's geography before you say, oh my God. I never dreamed an Olympic Medical Center would be an $800,000 a day business, but it is. Jefferson, I had a rough time finding that, Tony and Matt, you've got your work cut out for you there, but I did find it, actually I found it in the PDM yesterday. But when I went, I found everybody's financial statement online except Jefferson's, and I got the 404 file not found message. Uh, I think that's gonna change, you guys are we're behaving well. It's not meant to be critical. Just know that if somebody goes online, it's difficult to find, and maybe I wasn't resourceful. Uh, the worst slide on here. It's a tough one. All I want you to know from this slide is that the AMA two days ago put out that the cost of health care for a family today is $16,834. What's important about that number, other than that it's a monster, is it exceeds the minimum wage across the country. That's $8.09 an hour to pay that 16K in change. And Washington, I think it's 86% of our minimum wage, just 86%. And then the last curve on there is what employers are doing. They are bailing, but our client is uh, small business owners. The middle line, uh, the, or the top line is big guys, but the bottom line, 
There's only 55% of the businesses that are still in the game. The rest of them either never signed up or they failed. Back to business. Sorry about my voice. Business owners are key and they're losing hope. They're starting to run. Uh, everyone's talking about quality. We've got quality, okay? We all know that we have quality. The problem is access and cost. And those guys, I, I said they're angry, they don't know where the money is going. Well, you know where it's going. It's those things. I don't know if everybody understands gross margin. To get a gross margin of 80%, you got to market your product at 500%. So if you make it for 20 bucks, you sell it for 100. If you make it for 1,000, okay, you sell it for five, and so on. That's scary. Look at the next slide. The healthcare lobby just passed $540 million spent in D.C. We've only got 535 people representing us in D.C. Do the math. Just went 1.0 something. The lobbies, the big ones, American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, Pharmaceutical Lobby, the Biotechnology Lobby, the Medical Device Implant Lobby, and a bunch of individuals. Get this one, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce spends $25 million back there, much of it to oppose single-payer health care, which is contrary to the needs of their own membership. Why they do that is beyond me. That's part of our goal. Our Congress does not have the will to change this. That's become kind of an axiom. It isn't a one-party problem. When Obama tried to get some kind of universal health care through the first guy to stiff arm, it was Max Bacchus of Montana, who's a Democrat. Okay, this is going to be on your hand now. I want you to understand it. This is what I did the last six years, is that I worked with orthopedic implants. So, if you go into the hospital and have a hip implanted, Payment, and this varies by state, this varies quite a bit by state, but this is the average of what I saw. That hospital is going to get paid 18K for your pre op, post op lab, etc. This doesn't include the surgeon. Medicare is overhead somewhere in the realm of $500, so we're still talking about 18K as a cost to you and the government. If one of the blues does that, Hospital gets paid somewhere between forty-one and forty-six thousand dollars. Trust me, hospitals like that one a lot better than they like that eighteen. <laughs> then the overhead slash profit gets added in by the insurance company. Now we're talking fifty-six k cost to the employer and family. That's triple. In case anybody told you that the difference between those two is twenty-three percent, it's triple. When you have your elevator speech, it's like triple. Okay, I got a dig in my pocket for this one. Does everybody know what this stuff is? Flow names. Uh, I've been using this infrequently for 10 years. It's a fabulous product. Cleared out my, my nasal passages. I called Walgreens on Tuesday. What's flow names sell for these days? 119 bucks. What's the generic cost? 66 bucks if you just walk in without insurance. So guess what? You can go online and buy the real thing, not the generic, but the real thing made by GlaxoSmithKline in England from India for somewhere between $29 and $36, and they'll deliver it to your home illegally in the U.S. And it must be men who are doing this because they throw in a bottle of Cialis or a Viagra with it. <laughs> <laughs> Our Medicare people, CMS, are not allowed to negotiate pharmaceuticals. They're prohibited by public law for doing that, so if Pfizer wants to raise the price, it's too bad it happens. Okay, the end game. What's going to happen? No political will back east. It's got to happen here. I think we have the political will in this state to do it, but a few things have to change. And I believe state solutions will become regional ones. We've already talked about the ACA waiver, so I'm going to skip over that. Matt covered that really well. I recommend the starting point that those nine commissioners, uh, I guess you should know that, that the nine commissioners who, in charge, who would be in charge of the curse, 
I liken them to the base closure commissions because you build a cyclone fence around them and you keep the lobbyists away from them. Okay? You've got to find a way. They are appointed by the governor, so I'll never say they aren't political. I recommend we start somewhere around 120% of Medicare. I don't think Jefferson can make it on an 18K hit. I think they should get maybe a $22,000 hit, but I don't think anybody should be paying 56 or $56,000 for a hit either. There's a starting point. This is sausage. It has to be worked through our government. But somewhere in there, we have to find some levels that we start with. The docs that are making way north of a million dollars wouldn't be making that anymore. The primary care folks, family care folks, would do considerably better in a rural community doc could make. Pharmacy prices would look something like what's paid in other countries. And there'd be rewards for better outcomes. Here are the benefactors. Lots of retirees say, don't mess with my Medicare. Well, guess what? Your supplement will probably go down 75 to 100 bucks. Retirees do benefit. I think governments might be the biggest benefactors after family and business. All of those are benefactors. Here's some little, oh yeah, by the way, your auto insurance could go down because guess how much of your auto insurance is medical coverage quite a bit. L and I, I've never met a businessman that likes L and I. They detest it. Some of them still call it workman's comp. But yeah, that goes way down because a big chunk of that is, guess what? Medical insurance. I think the biggest employer in the state of Washington might be all the governments in the state of Washington. And they've all got employees and they're paying through the nose for health care insurance. I think maybe the biggest benefactor of all financially would be our government. Of course, Steve, he's going back to Olympia and he's facing the Cleary decision and 1531, the classroom size thing. Between them, they're over a $2 billion bogey for those guys when they get back down there with no income tax or anything to face it. Um, they're terrified of that. They don't know what they're going to do yet. Um, that's awful. Another little penny would be the Somebody who's not worried about health care might be able to leave a dead-end job and go out and innovate and start a company and hire some people. Who pays? Those guys. Governments already pay like 55% of the bill. Governments would pay. All employees or employers would pay. That includes Walmart and McDonald's. They wouldn't be buying health care. They'd just have a payroll assessment that would go uh, for their employee. Every hour of work would generate some health care revenue. Employees would pay, and yes, individuals would pay. Poor people, uh, some of them wouldn't. Who'd make less money? Same guys that were on that earlier list. That's the same set thrown at you again. They would make less money. All set and up, hopefully. PPA. I'm not talking about schools. I'm talking about something. This is my own little creation called Provoke, Teach, and Ask. When you get with somebody who, who objects, Take them on. And yeah, you have to provoke them a little bit to get their attention, but talk to them, tell them where the money is going, and give them numbers. The number one objection that I've found in my travels is I don't want that guy who doesn't work getting a free ride on my nickel. Number one, and less educated probably to say that more often. Here's an answer to it. If that person's son has hepatitis B, do you want him in class with your kid or grandkid? I don't. A healthy populace is a good thing. And if you have to give somebody a free ride because they're down on their luck, give it to them because there's plenty of money left over. Teach who deserves universal health care. More numbers. They're on that sheet that I just gave you. Teach people what can be done and then ask, 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 ask but make sure they agree with you. Ask to be invited back. Ask to get in front of a bigger group. Ask for a vote on our bill. Ask them to convince somebody else. Uh, maybe ask me to come talk to their combined group. Okay, your three-minute elevator speech. Number one, we all want the same thing. Even the people on the other side say they want affordable health care. The free ride objection. Know how to answer it. Someone has taken the money away and ruining this system. We can fix it. What a great motto. I believe other states will follow. 
but I'm not going to wait for the Fed. We don't dare wait for the Fed because we're all going to be gone. Business owners. Somehow in groups they're tougher to deal with than they are individually because sometimes they try to impress each other, I guess, like fighter pilots. <laughs> Trust me, I know that. Listen to them, teach, be direct. Talk about numbers and facts. If you're going to approach a business person, you better talk about numbers and facts because they don't like rhetoric. They do like numbers and they respond well to them. And ask them if they agree. And then ask them to act and get the bigger audience and ask for someone to come back and see them. Ask them to join us. It's a matter of time until we got some big business owners. I want Howard Schultz on our board. I don't even particularly like Howard Schultz, but he takes good care of his employees and he's vocal and he's rich. Summing up, our employers can't do this alone, but everybody can. Uh, we, we all know there's more, more than enough money in the hopper to treat everybody. It's just that somebody's taken a lot of that money away. And if you tell an employer, says, you know what, you, you know your earnings line. In fact, you control all aspects of your earnings line, but somebody else is enhancing their earnings line at the expense of your earnings line. Who? They don't know. We have to tell them. And their own lobby is shooting them in the foot. More about the Congress. We have to solve it at the state level. So get ready for some encounters. I was at my wife's re 50th reunion this summer, and there was some burly guy sitting next to me that looked like a football coach. Turned out to be a football coach. <laughs> He's also the regional director for Rotary. Well, he and I had what you might call a robust discussion about health might be the old friend that you haven't seen in years. It might be somebody, we've all got one really conservative relative who's coming over for Thanksgiving dinner. Get after him. That's why I've got a brother-in-law who's been on federal health care since he joined the Air Force at 23, now he's 73. And he's bitterly opposed to single parent. He's had public health care since he was a young man. So he and I are going to talk about hypocrisy. <laughs> <laughs> might be your boss, might be your legislator, uh, but all I'm saying here is it's time to quit just talking to the choir and go find us some CEOs and some people who can help change this. Again, if my CEO hit this, I'll share it with anybody. I can send that file right out to you. Okay, here's what I've heard from Olympia this year, uh, Steve. This is a good list, actually. <laughs> <laughs> There might be more, but these are the four I've heard. We're still working on ACA. Don't make us uh, look forward to this. No, we've already done ACA, and it's imperfect. It's time to look ahead. This is an incremental process, which is the, I, I, it's pig Latin for, we're still digesting the ACA. Okay. This bill is unfunded. I believe it's self-funding. We can only deal with those two things this time. I don't blame these guys for being terrified. I believe our bill will help them deal with the $2 billion plus bogey. Okay? It has to be choreographed, but it can be done. I believe those four statements are booting the ball down the road, and we are out of time. This is not a political issue as much as some people want it to be. Some people make it a political issue. This isn't a liberal Republican issue. It's about families and survival. Call it what you wish. I happen to not like the single payer term because when I talk to a businessman, they think he's, they think they're the single payer. <laughs> so that that term is uh, not very good. I like either of the other two. Uh, if this were being done by the Republican National Committee, they'd have a clever thing to call it by now, and we're still fumbling that one. Shame on us. But universal or Medicare for all, both. Whatever. It's amazing that we have this much strife with the other side when our incentives are as well aligned as they are. It's all about clarity. So, on your handout, please join these organizations. These are good folks who are out fighting the war. And some of them are in this room. There's how to reach all of them. There's the video, there's the YouTube address for that splendid video you just saw, which is really, really good. I'm done. Thanks so much. Steve, we're giving you an opportunity to respond and invite you to 
to uh, ask this panel any questions or clarification or are things uh, that you would like to point out and what they said. So Steve is yours. So um, let me just make a couple comments on what people have said and I think it's all true. I mean, it's all right. Can you all hear? No. So um, I think, you know, good presentations. I think it's all correct. I think the list is a good one on what the excuses are in Olympia. I mean, those are um, real. And I think part of the challenge is, in fact, it might not be a partisan political issue, but it's certainly a political issue. Um, and there is, um, and any of you that have read T.R. Reid's book on healing America, you understand that in the examples he cites, the countries that are successful like Taiwan or New Zealand or Japan or all the other countries besides, you know, besides us, is there is acceptance that there is a moral imperative to provide health care. We do not have that acceptance here. And that leads into our politics. And we live in a market economy for sure, and in a lot of ways a market society. And I'm not saying that's a positive, but those are political realities. So these lists that Pat's made um, are, they're right. The pharmaceutical companies, the hospitals, the uh, medical associations, I mean, since I've been in healthcare, some of the most difficult battles we have on healthcare are scope of practice. What are chiropractors allowed to do? What are massage therapists allowed to do? What are dentists allowed to do? What are mid-level practitioners allowed to do? And that's just, that's not, I mean, it leads to reimbursement rates and has a dollar component, but it's really just what's your scope of practice? The Department of Health has, I think, 23 boards and commissions to just look at the different segments of practitioner from, from chiropractor, psychologist, doctor. So this is a incredibly entrenched system. There's no question, I mean, I signed a petition, there's no question that single payer would help relieve a lot of that. But it is incremental. We have a long way to go. Um, one, in educating folks, I think, on the understanding of the moral imperative. And secondly, we have a long way to go in reaching those folks that are <coughs> representing and um, partners with uh, a number of the seven or eight major constituencies here. So um, I think just as a strategy, Talking to the tribe is probably not too productive. But talking to representatives uh, that maybe don't share this view, um, and I think you could look at chairmanships or ranking members from the Republican Party in Olympia. Um, if, they're, if they're a chair of a health care committee or if they're a chair of, uh, or a ranking member of the Democratic chair, those folks are the, probably some of the folks that need to hear this message and be convinced about the need here. Um, those of us that understand it, um, I think we understand it, but the politics are overwhelming. And if you look at the Affordable Care Act, which a lot of us feel is not the answer, and look at the pain that people went through to get just that, which is which was basically what Richard Nixon proposed in the 70s. And then look at the pain that's been inflicted once it was enacted. Uh, and I hate to be um, a political realist, but you know, that's my job. I work, my work is to be involved and have those discussions. Um, and I think that that's our challenge, is to speak to folks that don't, with the understanding we have 
of why they need to look at some of these changes. Um, I think Matt's presentation is spot on the, in the rural situation. I mean, we are losing independent doctors. I would argue, I mean, some of these independent profit clinics, um, there's a strategy to like close them down. Their reimbursement rates, their hassle, to their reimbursement rates, they, it's, if you're a nonprofit clinic, you do better. One could argue that maybe is, um, is the way to go, particularly in rural areas, but for some doctors, they don't want to do that. They don't want to be, you know, in a nonprofit clinic, nor do they want to be assumed into a larger hospital organization. So, um, this is a very clear uh, presentation on the challenges and the advantages of moving to a trust or a single payer system. <coughs> Um, but I think we need to be realistic um, about the political reality and broaden our tribe, if you will, broaden the people we talk to who don't understand it and don't get it. And that's, uh, that's the challenge and that will take time. So that's not particularly uplifting, maybe, um, unless you think challenges are uplifting, which I do, um, but I think it's a, it's a real, it's, it's a real depiction of the terrain we're trying to operate. Um, and I'm certainly interested in comments that, and ideas around that kind of those, those what I presented, and what, certainly I think everybody else up here is interested in that. Um, but uh, kind of a political, I guess, reality check. Uh, would other members of the panel like to respond to Steve's comments? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was I was glad to hear you say that ultimately it is a moral decision. Um, you know we can we can talk about you know as you say business and facts business and facts you know two hours of this in your eyes closed building either you've heard it before or it's in your denial or whatever um, we tend to go that far but not any further. You know in the movie they talked about the women getting the vote, and this was a problem and we fixed it. I, I, I don't think that's actually the best example in our history. Our history, you know, in 1963, I'll back up, I, I lived in Beaver, South Carolina for nine years. In 1963, it was completely legal to have separate water fountains, separate schools, and all the doctors had separate waiting rooms, black and white, 1963. That didn't end until courageous people said, this is enough, this is morally reprehensible. That's, how, that's what it took. And you know, we can, we can talk about policy, we can talk about funding, we can talk about mechanisms, we can talk about all this stuff. But unless there's an outcry from the people that really are being harmed by, these poli by, by the current system, it's not going to change. That's part of the elevator talk, too. I mean, how can, you, how can you morally tell somebody that their kid isn't going to get health care? I've seen it happen. I've seen kids die, literally, with my own two eyes, because their parents were poor and they had no access to health care, and the only portal of access was the emergency room, and whoops, it was too late. That's no way to run a system. It's not the world's richest country. You can do better than that. So um, I really appreciate your comments. I mean, about your uh, your political realism, and it just sort of reinforces what I've learned um, and am learning about politics is you can't really expect your political leaders to do something unless their constituents are asking them to do it. And so um, you know, there's a lot of support in Jefferson County uh, to push for this. But you know, we need that, if we want our representatives to really feel um, that they can go and, and stand for this, they need the entire constituent uh, base to be pushing for it. And so how do you do that? Um, I mean, yeah, there's the one-to-one the -one conversations you can do, but I'm really enjoying the thought of pressure from local government level. You know, it may, especially public hospital districts. You know, I'm, I'm hoping our public hospital district can be the first one to say, 
You know, from a really an impartial point of view, there's no lobbyist money going to public hospital commissioners. You know, there's really no, not really much money at all. Really? Really. So we are really impartial, you know, and we can speak with our, our doctors, and if a public hospital district says, this is a good idea, we really think that this should be pushed for, my hope is we can then encourage our neighboring public hospital district, the Olympic, you know, Olympics, have them have that dialogue, have that be an issue in their campaigns for a hospital commissioner. You know, do you agree with Jefferson Healthcare that we should do this? And then why not, you know, the uh, Washington Association of Public Hospital Districts? You know, I've, I've gone, this year I've gone to all the conferences uh, with WISHA and the Association of Public Hospital Districts, and they didn't mention single payer once. They only got mentioned once when I raised my hand and said, when you're talking about innovation in healthcare in all these different states, why don't you mention Vermont and what they're doing? And that was the only way I got the issue, I got to hear the issue talked about. But public hospital districts, if commissions start endorsing this, we can start pushing these state organizations to think about this, to talk about it. And if the Washington State Hospital Association said we should do this, you know what kind of pressure that would put and support that would give to our representatives in office? So, and, uh, and I wouldn't stop, as I said, at public hospital districts, you know? Talk to your city council members, uh, county commissioners. Let's, let's get the dialogue at the grassroots level because it will give our representatives the support they need and it also let the debate happen, uh, you know, in some cases, it won't force them to be championing the debate, you know? <laughs> let the hospital commissioners and the city council members really get the debate going and so that, you know, once they support it, it'll be easier for our representatives to do so too. Here, here. <laughs> of the waiver. Somebody approached me two weeks ago and said, remember the Star Wars movie when they figured out that the vulnerable part of the Death Star, blah, blah, blah. He said, I think the reason that there have been so many votes in the House of Representatives to end Obamacare is they found that little point of vulnerability, and that's called that waiver, that states could enact that and run with it, and that that's why they wanted it to end. Because let's face it, the insurance companies and all of my list of seven are all doing just fine under Obamacare, so why are they so bitterly opposed to it? This theory was that it's that waiver and the potential of the state running with it and going rogue. All right, uh, we have an eager physician out here who wants, wants to speak, and uh, I'm gonna honor her request. I'm going to say to any of you who want to speak, that uh, first you need to sign permission to be to be taped, you can do be taped. And then uh, secondly, please keep your comments within a couple of minutes. I know that's not easy to do, but we have comments lining up. The other, and questions, obviously we want your questions too. The other thing I want to tell you is apparently some of you we have just totally put off because we're going to, you want you don't maybe want to be taped. So I have lots of questions here, which I've sorted, so we're in for some really good discussion here. So again, please proceed, say who you are, where you're from, and remember the time. Hi, I'm Catherine Ottaway. I'm a family doc in town here for 14 years. I worked for Jefferson Healthcare Hospital for nine years, and then I um, fought to the point about them setting up the quota where the county district said they no longer wish to have me working for them. So now I'm going in the other direction. I opened my own private practice, and it is successful. And initially, I started only with Medicare. That was the only insurance I took when I first opened Medicare and cash. So now we're taking all the insurances. We haven't got all the Medicaids um, yet, but that's what we're doing. So I want to challenge you, Mr. Clarenger, um, regarding the, that we don't have a moral imperative. I would say yes, we do, because our agreement in this country is that anyone who's sick can go to the emergency room. That's our moral imperative. We have already agreed that healthcare is a human right. You can go to the emergency room. Unfortunately, that is the most expensive, stupidest way to take care of people that you can imagine. Because, hello, 
They do not take care of diabetes in the emergency room. We don't take care of uh, congestive heart failure. We don't talk to people about their diet, about smoking, about stopping drinking, about stopping using methamphetamines. I'm sorry, but it's a stupid way to take care of people. So we have the moral imperative. Now what we need to do is have the political will, and we all need to stand up and say, we want single payer, we want an efficient system, we're tired of the corporation, and I own my own corporation. My corporation has decided it's paying for birth control, and if somebody wants Viagra, they better not come work for me, because I'd rather pay for birth control than Viagra. Thank you very much. So, some of the corporations are speaking up, and I own one, and I am going to fight for single payer. I went across the country in 2009 as one of the Madden Health Doctors. I did California in 2010, and I'm going to be back fighting. My sister died in 2012, my father last year, so I've been working on that, but I'm back. <laughs> respond to her statement that there is already a moral imperative because provisions have been made to provide uh, care to people in emergency rooms. Well, no, I think she makes a good point. I, as folks remember, that was George W. Bush's answer to universal health care was to use the emergency room. So, um, <laughs> But I, I think there's a difference in the what she cites, and that's the practicality of it. I think that's true. Uh, that you can't go to the emergency room. And I think there's a difference between that and what is in people's minds about willing to have a payroll tax because they feel it's the moral obligation to do that. So th I think that's where the disconnect is in my mind. But I agree with you that people feel that you can get care somewhere in America. Um, it's just who pays for it. They don't understand that they're maybe paying for that emergency room care with a you know, 150% premium on what their care is. But that's, you know, hitting the least complication with health care. But I, I, it's, a, it's a point well taken that you can't have access. I don't think the general public realizes that that's what we're doing. Any other comments? All right, please say your name and where are you from? Where are you? My name is Jennifer Grinch, and I'm from Fort Townsend, Washington. And I thank all of the members of the panel for the presentation. And I see a shortcoming. My, the shortcoming I see is the people like us who are already, you know, preaching to the converted, who are already for single payer, need to have specific suggestions on how to address the arguments against single payer. We need to know and dispel the myths and fears that many uninformed Americans have about single payer. One of them is fraud, and the numbers can testify to uh, the fraud and the minimal amount of fraud that there is in Medicare. The other common uh, thing that I hear from people against single payer is they use the term, that socialized medicine. And that has a very um, pejorative connotation. And in my old economics textbook, it says socialization is the government ownership of the means of production. And my answer to that is I lived in Denmark. I married to a Dane. I was upset that you didn't have Denmark. It was one of those countries up there because it has one of the best national health systems, healthcare systems in the world, far superior to many others. They do not have government ownership of the means of production. Physicians are not government employees. They are, they get a fee for every person who signs up for a year to be on their patient list, and they get additional fees for every patient visit. I'm going okay. to, I'm going I'll to stop there. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop there. In other words, please help us uh, prepare arguments to dispel myths and fears about post socialized okay. medicine. Can the members, uh, other members, yes. Yeah, so just to interject, you're absolutely right. My experience in New Zealand was that the health system was more entrepreneurial, not less. This is crushing corporatism, which is neither here nor there, and the result is what you see. Uh, all right, you, have, you represent organizations who are advocating. What are your answers to it? Do you have information for her, or what do you? Matt, do you have I a mean, response? I would just say, I mean, yeah, the Physicians for a National Health Plan and Healthcare for All Washington websites are amazing resources 
for, for tuning up. They have cheat sheets for the top 10 arguments. Um, so great resource. And email the link to this video. It's been awesome. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, which is on the back of your agenda, by the way. All right. Yes. Um, my name is Jane Vanderhoof. I live in um, Port Angeles and also in Joyce. And I've been an RN for 35 years and now retired as a farmer. Anyway, to get to my point of what Matt was talking about, dealing with your issues on a local level, I have huge uh, problems with my own health care issues over the last month. I have now received a bill for $42 that I am going to fight with my provider in Port Angeles because I, isn't it true that rural medicine gets extra money from the government because we're rural people and so they have an obligation to take care of things and if they can on the rural level on some like moral obligation. However, I've had to go to Seattle back to here, back to Seattle, back to here. I'm too, I just am new to Medicare. So um, I am going to take, do you suggest that I take my $42 bill to I've already made phone calls about this, and the, and, um, the f a family medicine who was just written up in the last, I couldn't even read the PDN because I was in Seattle dealing with my health care issues. And so when I get home, I read this huge article about family medicine in Port Angeles and how each doctor has a caseload of 1,500 patients. Can I ask you to get to your question? Yes. Yeah. So do I, should I take this like, issue to my and fight it there because then I can get them to see this is a horrible thing because I don't usually fight my medical bills. Um, I, I want to understand your specific case, but I, I'd be happy to just talk to you after this. Um, so well, I, really I, don't, yeah, I don't care about the specifics of it. Okay. No, I would pay my $42 bill, but I want to see how I can jumpstart my local provider without having to go and find a new provider. Uh, I, I would suggest you talk afterwards um, if you um, if you don't mind. No, I don't. Um, yeah, I think it. I mean, the question here you're asking, you're asking some of the process question as to how do you how do you do this differently and get your provider responding, and then how do you find another provider? Is that correct? No, I don't care. I can find another provider. My question is a much bigger one. I want to take on the whole state, and I want to take on the whole effing government because I am sick of it. My fa I just dealt with hospice dealings with my father's death. I dealt with the California. I, I'm sort of so tired of the you whole know, actually, you're Actually, your question, now that I understand it better, goes along with there's quite a bit of, of question here about, uh, in fact, this is, this, this is your question. Yeah, I, 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 I as a Port Angeles citizen at a local level, affect a change in city council. Right, that's my next question. That's my next question. question. All right, Jane, we got it. Now, response, please. Uh, your local map. So, how do you affect change to say in Clown County? In, um, well, right, I just moved into Port Angeles, and now I can go to my city council members and complain. How do I do that? To, for city council, you can go to their city council meetings. Well, what do I ask them to do? I don't know what to do. Well, it depends. It depends exactly. If you're talking about single payer, um, yeah, yeah, it's all about single payer. Yeah, then you just you challenge them to uh, educate themselves about single payer and consider a resolution in support of it. It's yeah. as simple as that, and you can talk to them one on one. You can talk at their public meetings. Um, but they have no no incentive okay, to do that. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next questioner. Thank you.